Good evening, and once again, welcome to the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And it's Monday night, so you know what time it's... It is. <laughs> it's time for new comics, bitches! So, uh... For those of you who caught, uh, yes, this this will not be a. Uh, I know that all of you are looking forward to another edition of Cats Comics Corner, and hopefully we will get around to that again someday soon, sooner rather than later. Uh, but for now, it's just me, so you're gonna have to put up with me for the next you know hour and a half. Depending on how long it is, because this is—I think there's—I got, I got 11 or 12 books to cover this week. So, um, since there's no uh, immediate news that I can think of, uh, let's just. Oh yeah, um, well, there is one bit of news. Um, so, uh, apparently, and this is just in the comic book movie news, um, is that apparently the reboot for The Crow uh, has finally gotten its lead. I know that there are several names they went through. There was Tom Hiddleston. There was uh, like in, you know, Bradley Cooper, Channing Tatum. Uh, so on and so forth. They've finally settled on someone, and it's Luke Evans, uh, who I honestly only remember it from uh, from uh, the Raven, which is one of the worst films of 2012. Uh, and but apparently it was also in the Immortals, which was another awful film. I think that was 2011. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's who apparently is going to play the new Eric, whether they can, whether or not they will continue to give him the name Eric Draven, uh, I don't know, but, uh, for right now, he is going to be Eric, apparently. So, come on. There you go. Okay. So, hey, hello, Daryl. Oh, you're just looking out the window. So, yes, I have a cat coming out of my head, I know. So let's get on to the comics, and when I tell you pick of the week this week, you're probably going to be pretty fucking surprised, because I know that I was. Um, let's start where we normally start, and that's with Marvel. Uh, this week, pretty much kind of owned by the, uh, well, no, I mean, I think they're all kind of even. I think there's four books, well, there's three books from DC, uh... Uh, four, there's four from DC, four from Marvel, and four Independents. So, let's go on with all new X-Men number 11. So, basically we have the aftermath of, you know, where we, we already knew, but in case those of you who didn't know, um, yes, so it's, uh, it's Angel uh, who did decide to leave with the with the new uh, Xavier School, you know, basically, you know, the the uncanny uh, part of the X Men, and this is to uh, no one's delight except, of course, for the the uncanny guys. And Jean looks to kind of, you know, everybody's trying to put a stop to it, you know, and then you know, Storm seems to be kind of the only voice of reason here, saying, you know, no mutant on mutant fighting, but uh, ultimately it's, you know, Jean with her new psychic abilities, who she do doesn't quite understand how to control yet, still is trying to block Warren from leaving, and does so psychically. Uh, which then puts her under assault by the uh, Stepford Cuckoos. And then basically all hell breaks loose. Um, so you know, breaking into a, you know, a big kind of Donnybrook between, you know, the different teams and, uh, you know, eventually it all starts to kind of calm down after Emma has taught... Jean Grey a lesson, 
and uh, Mystique and her gang are up to their tricks right now at a Stark Industries uh, plant in which they are able to, basically Mystique convinces everyone that she's Pepper Potts and that uh, she needs access to Tony's money, and which of course is granted, and then all of a sudden mutants start to break in, you know, and destroy the plant that's around them, and Mystique looks to start transferring lots of Tony Stark's funding. There's lots of her, lots of his funds to her. Uh, Kitty and Jean uh, basically have a bit of a heart to heart here. Um, as far as how Jean has been using her powers very irresponsibly and even calls into play the motto of the Amazing Spider-Man. You know, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, and so they have, you know, this, this nice little moment and then they decide that they are going to go off and see what they can do about getting Warren back but then they are confronted by the uncanny Avengers. And they don't look pleased. Uh, now, the more I think about this ending, the more I dislike it. Uh, there's, some, there's some really, again, there's really good story beats here. Uh, there's some fun uh, within the book itself. I like the scene with, with Kitty and Jean. Uh, I, I really like the kind of, you know, that this this still pervasive jealousy that Emma feels towards Jean Grey. Um, and, uh, you know, even, you know, to the point where she has, you know, she's inflicting a great deal of pain psychically on Jean to, again, quote-unquote, teach her a lesson. But it's really more about, you know, it's really more about a power trip and about jealousy than it is about anything else. Um, but this ending with the Uncanny Avengers uh, kind of popping in to kind of get everybody out of the, the jet, which is which now includes, you know, it has the, the, the four remaining originals and it has Wolverine, uh, who of course is a member of the Uncanny Avengers, and Now, we've already had this discussion in this series with Captain America and the Avengers. So why are the Uncanny Avengers in on it now? I mean, the only thing that I can assume here is that there is some, uh, you know, there's uh, some... Uh, you know, potential conflict in regards to Havoc because that is indeed his his big brother. Of course, he's younger, much younger. Uh, there's still, you know, a little bit of culture shock here. There, there are good story beats in this issue, but again, this ending, I'm not too keen on, because, like I said, we've, this is familiar ground this book has already tread upon. So, um, I would say it's, you know, I, I gave it originally a four out of five, but I would say this is more of about a three and a half out of five because that ending does take some. Uh, it, it takes a, a little bit off that rating there because, again, it's, you know, it's 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 covered territory. Uh, again, unless there's something that Havoc, uh, and Scarlet Witch really are looking to bring to the proceedings that weren't there before. Uh, even though Captain America is there, and that doesn't really make you know, and Thor, so it's starting to like. Uh, what? Why? What? Why? So, again, I would say three and a half out of five for all new X-Men number 11. Still a good book, though. Um, now, on to Hot Guy number 10. And basically here we have the story of Kazi. Uh, who is ultimately is the assassin that the tracks of Dracula's have hired to kill Hawkeye and have had and apparently has had them kill for them before and he is at a party with Kate Bishop and it's one of her father's parties and we see his beginning this you know he obviously comes from whatever part of the world that you know some kind of former Eastern Bloc country that's in the midst of a civil war. 
you know, it's, uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it seems to be very horrible. He's, you know, a mime or a clown uh, of some sort in a circus that is attacked in this war. And uh, he and his brother are saved by, uh, looks like, you know, again, the tracksuit Draculas. And uh, ultimately his brother is killed in this war. So Kazi's got a lot of, a lot of issues to, to deal with here. Um, but one of these issues turns out to be uh, kind of maybe trying to win the heart of young Kate. And, but it's clear that he knows who she is and that she is part of the, the hot guy team. And we then, uh, you know, she, and she is seriously crushing on him, but she also does lead Kazi back to, uh, to this, uh, to, uh, to Clint's place where Clint is still kind of reeling from the kind of, uh, uh, the assault, uh, of the, of the ladies from the previous issue, uh, where, you know, everybody, you know, all the girls were just laying the smack down on Bobby, you know, Jessica, Natasha, and even Kate herself. And, um, and this is all, of course, this is all taking place before the events of the last issue, uh, because we do again have to see the final page of uh, of Grills getting murdered by Kazi. And when he when he says that he's from hell, I, I thought at first this was kind of like this was kind of like a riff on like Jack the Ripper type of thing or something like that. But no, I mean he he comes from a real hellhole. His original home. There's now the artist in this issue and the next is Francesco Francavilla, uh, which is a joy to see as always to see him illustrate a full issue. Um, and he does illustrate the living hell out of this thing. It doesn't have the more traditional approach of someone like David Aja or Javier Polito uh, is not broken into the multiple panels. The panel structure is very much of the uh, Francavia variety here. Um, and that's great because I don't like it when another artist just comes in and just starts aping the other person's style. He doesn't do that here. He definitely makes this book very much his own. It's just that the only thing about this book is that Fraction's usual storytelling skills are not entirely there here. You know, this, um, it lacks uh, some of the depth. It lacks a lot of the quirk. But this is a more this is a much more serious story that we're dealing with in this issue. So that wasn't something that bothered me. That it was kind of not. It didn't have kind of the usual snappy quirky elements to it, but it does have, and it does have some, but uh, ultimately it just, it, this feels like a pretty straightforward issue as far as to exploring the, uh, what makes Kazi tick and why he's working with or working for the tracks of Dracula's. And there's a little bit of growing here in this book but not that much. And, uh, you know, we see in flashbacks, of course, the various jobs that, uh, and, the, you know, the various evil deeds that Kazi has done while wearing his, you know, his face paint and everything like that. And, you know, there is, you know, obviously something about losing a family member to horrible violence that causes people to kind of go off the rails. And that's exactly what uh, Kazi's done here. But there doesn't seem to be, at this point in time, any kind of jingoistic or national pride just kind of behind this. It just seems that he 
knows that he's good at killing people and knows that he can continue to do it and make money. There's some really nice stuff that uh, that Fraction does include here uh, about you know this you know about New York City itself and how it was originally built to kind of resemble the capitals of Europe, and then some you know basically somebody you know turned it into a grid formation, and uh, you know there's some you know, kind of postcard overlays and things like that. And it's just, it, it looks gorgeous, as pretty much every issue of Hawkeye has. But it just lacks some of the, some of the things that make it Hawkeye. And like I said, I appreciate what Fraction is doing here. And don't get me wrong, this is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a poor book. It just, it isn't, you know, this would normally be, you know, Hawkeye is pretty much, you know, at the top of the list of must-reads each week that it's out. And this just doesn't quite have everything that it normally can bring to the table. So this is, it's easy, a four and a half out of five, but it's, it's just, like I said, it's just not all the way there. Um, so... Four and a half out of five, again, for, for Hawkeye, number 10. Indestructible Hulk, number seven. Uh, well, sadly, it turns out that Hulk wasn't worthy, that it was actually just this whole kind of momentum of him getting the hammer was actually Thor calling Mjolnir back to himself and it just happened to go through a bunch of frost giants on the way. Um... But he's obviously still liking the smashing of, of the Frost Giants uh, alongside Thor. But unfortunately, back Earthside, or Midgard side, uh, we have the, um, the portal is discovered by one of the Frost Giants. And Hill has to make a very hasty decision to close down the portal that leads to Jotunheim. Uh, and, you know, basically destroying it so that they can't get through, but the Frost Giants get it in their head that this is, you know, this is pretty much an instantaneous portal into Midgard, so we want, they want that. They just, they want that. And uh, so we have, you know, this confrontation between uh, the Frost Giants and some of the humans, and they're kind of driven away for, for the meantime by Thor and Hulk, and then Hulk uh, saves uh, one of the members of his, uh, his team, uh, this character, Patty, uh, who has a secret to tell. And, but another a member of the team is, has a bait and switch done by the Jotuns, uh, is basically one of them is kind of captured, kidnapped, whatever you want to call it, and one of them turns into, you know, kind of morphs into whatever, a member of, of the group. Uh, so they can stay in and listen in, and, uh, you know, there is... Uh, and then still back on Midgard in the lab, they are trying desperately to put the... Uh, the the scientist there who was the former kind of the the kind of bad uh, the 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 bad girl who used to work for people like AIM and Baron Zemo and whoever you know just wanted uh, you know their, her scientific expertise she was the one who designed this machine one of them is back there on Jotunheim. And so when she kind of fixes it, it seems to open up kind of an infinite realm. And of course, you know, and then back on Jotunheim, Banner also talks about the fact that, you know, this is not the Thor that he has met yet. Uh, that, in fact, the machine is not only uh, a portal between worlds, it's a portal through time which explains why Thor does not know him, that this isn't an alternate universe tale. This is indeed in the Marvel Universe proper. It's just that these two haven't, you know, Thor and Banner have not met yet, and which does, you know, lead to a nice moment where, you know, uh, 
Thor asks, you know, are we comrades in arms? And Banner says, occasionally. <laughs> and what about the not so occasionally? Uh, and we have Patty again revealing the secret of why exactly she's on Banner's team and that she is indeed, uh, she is terminally ill. And she wants to basically die through what she refers to as SBH, or Suicide by Hulk. Now, while this isn't the most sublime or literate issue that Mark Wade has ever written, he and Simonson are clearly having a lot of fun <laughs> creating this story. Uh, and it is. It is huge fun, huge big adventure fun, and, you know, it's fantastical, and it has all the elements that make this book, this issue, and this arc so far an incredibly fun read. Um, you know, I'm, I'm loving, you know, the, uh, the kind of... Uh, I'm, I'm loving, you know, Thor's attitude and just how, you know, how excited he is. You know, he's really, he's really happy that he's fighting alongside these, these Midgardians. And one of them is a shapeshifter um, and is incredibly powerful. Uh, and, you know, he just keeps marveling at, like, kind of the, not so much the, just kind of the, uh, uh, kind of, the, the gall that that the Midgardians have, you know, by coming there to get this, you know, precious element and, you know, defying all manners of odds and death and so on and so forth. But we still obviously have a good deal of story to go before and even if they can get to a point. And will, Hulk, will Thor and Hulk continue to fight alongside of each other or will they eventually clash um you know you know this is this you get the feeling that this is the kind of thing that once uh mark wade started writing this book this was the kind of story that he wanted to tell by getting the chance to work with walt simonson whose art is you know really very much up to snuff here it looks terrific and it has that super dynamic feel all throughout the book. Um, you know, again, faces can kind of look weird with with Simons, and that's not, you know, teeth particularly, is that they all seem to be very, very kind of straight line and everything like that. And, you know, it's not as exacting, but it's Walt Simonson, so that's, <laughs> anything is pretty much excusable, especially when he's doing a Thor story. And I know that eventually he'll leave and some other artists will come in, but until then, I am enjoying the hell out of uh, Indestructible Hulk right now. So th this is a four and a half out of five solid for Indestructible Hulk number seven. So now on to the independence, and we will start with Dynamite. And we'll start with uh, another uh, one of the the first of like, one, two, three, four number ones that I'll be talking about this week, and that is Black Bat number one. And this is uh, Brian Buccioletto, the co-writer uh, along with Francis Manipal on Flash, which I'm not reading currently. Uh, that was kind of a drop. Uh, if Francis Manipal is not on art, I don't really have that much invested in it. Uh, although, I mean, who knows? But anyway, not to get off track. And uh, artist uh, Ronan Cliquet, or Cliquet, or however it's exactly pronounced, uh, they take on the character of Tony Quinn. Uh, now, this is a... Uh, Tony Quinn is a morally bankrupt defense attorney who uh, loses his eyes, uh, presumably to one of his clients, and is basically uh, now working for a clandestine organization, uh, like kind of a equalizer, night industries, 
you know, kind of organization that give him these eyes that have this sort of bat vision or sonar sense, if you will. And basically he's looking to take down the people that have ruined his life. And, you know, this involves, you know, going up against some very sordid people and, uh, you know, there's basically, you know, there's some cop kidnappings and he's convinced, uh, Quinn is convinced that uh, this guy who uh, we're assuming, again, that ruined his life, well, he basically says that this guy ruined his life, is behind these kidnappings of cops in his city. And, you know, he's, you know, he is blind, uh, but again, has, <laughs> so he's not, you know, full-fledged, like, vigilante in the sense of, like, a, you know, someone who is doing good because he has the ability to, you know, this is a guy that is right now is very much on a vendetta. Um, so, and, you know, and he has kind of passed the first test of having these new eyes and, and taking on the, the bad guys. Um, so if this story sounds vaguely familiar, defense attorney by day, sightless vigilante at night, who has this kind of extra sense, this extra vision. Uh, if it sounds familiar, you're right to think that it sounds familiar, because I, I don't know if it's ever been fully stated, but it seems very much that Black Bat is kind of a progenitor of Daredevil, uh, because these two stories do seem to be very similar, because we do have, you know, this, uh, you know, this lawyer... Uh, you know, this defense attorney who, uh, you know, blind, bl basically blind lawyer vigilante with father issues because his father was a, uh, he was a prosecutor and he sees, you know, what his son is doing. And so it's, it, again, whether or not, you know, his father will really come into play here, he certainly does in this issue. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's not quite as on the nose as, well, okay, well, these people killed my father, so I'm going to fix, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take them down and then become a hero along the way. Um, so, but Booch and, uh, and Clique, they, they give it enough of a decent spin, and some pretty good beats here within the book, some, uh, some, some nice action beats, uh, some pretty decent character moments. You know, there's this mysterious organization that's helping him. You know, we, we get glimpses, but, you know, of course, there's the, the beautiful kind of assistant, if you will, uh, who is, you know, working on behalf of this clandestine organization. All these things, they're, they're enough there to, to, to keep your interest. And, you know, it's certainly a lot better than the other recent, uh, you know, pulp reboot that Dynamite has done, which is Miss Fury, which the second issue came out of this week, and I did kind of glance at it for a couple minutes, and I'm like, I don't care <laughs> here. Uh, Rona Cliquet's art is, is is pretty good. It's, it's I would say it's definitely more than passable. Um, and again, uh, Buccioletto does, you know, a solid job with keeping you interested Maybe, I mean, it will, time will tell, but this will be a book that I will continue to read um, and hopefully enjoy. And so, this is a, again, this is a good read. It's three and a half out of five for Black Bat number one. I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. He doesn't have the twin guns yet, which is, you know, kind of a staple. And even we see it in the multiple variant covers of this issue. Um... You know, every single, you know, that, that's the thing about Dynamite that does bother me, though, sometimes, that it's, it seems to be the company of, well, okay, here's the, you know, we have to have variants of every single cover of every single, you know, title that we put out. So, whatever. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So that brings us to Valiant and Harbinger Wars, number two. Now, basically, we have Generation Zero, which is, we do have on the first page, we have a nice little breakdown of the, of the four groups that are, that are involved in the Harbinger Wars. Of course, there is Bloodshot and the Young Psyots. We have, uh, you know, the Harada Institute, you know, the Harbinger Foundation, and we have, of course, the Renegades, and we have Generation Zero, which are the people that PRS, you know, the, the kids that PRS was sending into China and everything like that to clear that out. Um, the kids who were basically planning on an escape, and they crashed the helicopter that they escaped in, in the previous issue, into one of the top floors of the Bellagio in Las Vegas and actually kill some people and they don't uh, presumably some innocent people as well but they see the kind of as they call it this kind of fatal flawed opulence around them and they feel that it's criminal so that the people that are there don't really deserve to live so already we get the sense that their moral compass has been very very uh, <laughs> has been has been made very askew by PRS, um, and they basically they stage kind of a hostage situation at the Bellagio to prevent anybody from coming after them, particularly from PRS. And then PRS, of course, you know we have this you know because this is nine days before, and then we have the the now, which is PRS meeting with. Uh, the the NSA and talking about what you know basically explaining what's been you know what's going on to the National Security Council and uh, basically then we have the confrontation that we left off in with issue number one which is the confrontation that that was set up I should say in issue number one which is the confrontation between Bloodshot and Harada. Now, we then enter into some kind of RoboCop-esque territory here where Bloodshot basically has kind of a subroutine written into his coding, which actually activates when he's, with, when he's in the presence of Toyo Harada, which they call very simply the Harada Protocol. And it basically it overwrites his protocol so that he goes, you know, full hog on and starts basically trying to kill Harada. That's, you know, that's PRS's goal. And so, I mean, and it becomes insane. He, you know, he's vomiting out nanites. He's, you know, his head splits open and this, you know, kind of psychic kind of bomb goes off, if you will, that really affects uh, people in, like, in their direct vicinity. And Harada is actually stripped down to a point where we actually see his true face, the face of an old man. And, but ultimately Harada and the other Harbingers get the upper hand. They, f and they try and they are on the verge of defeating Bloodshot, but then Bloodshot is saved by the kid Syots and uh, presumably uh, Kara. I don't know if she's there. Uh, I didn't really see her. Um, but definitely by, by the younger Psyots that he's just rescued. Um, and this forces uh, Harada kind of into retreat mode a little bit. Um, and we get another glimpse of just how ruthless uh, Harada can be as he, you know, he knows that he has these nanites that are going to kill him kind of cell by cell running through his bloodstream. So he actually s slashes his own wrist punches his fist into the chest of one of his own foundation Syots, and it infects her and kills her. So it's like, okay. Um, and then we have this, this one guy living on his own in Alaska, and he is called upon by PRS by... Uh, you know, as a member, he is the first member of the hardcore. 
Now it's H A R D C O R P S. So N H A R D standing for Harbinger Active Resistance Division. And then you have core at the end of that. And basically they you know they are forcing this man who has been absent from you know because he's a hunter of psyots he basically was made obsolete by bloodshot and but since bloodshot is now a renegade himself we have you know the you know he's uh you know they have to bring the hardcore back into the fold so this guy gets activated and he's there basically to kill to, to send in to kill generation zero and keep this from becoming you know a total clusterfuck of embarrassment uh, and possibly you know just all sorts of badness that would be heaped on prs's front door but of course just as he's activated by prs that's when the heart that's when the renegades come walking into town and they're ready to go. So, oh, I mean, uh, Josh Dysart and Dwayne Straczynski really, you know, they they kind of started off this series with a bit of a slow burn in the first issue, but they switched to extremely high gear <laughs> in this issue and just go, you know, just really ramping up the, the action, the suspense, and the characters. I mean, you're really getting a sense of these new characters, uh, particularly from Generation Zero, and uh, also the young, the the young Psyots that are in Bloodshot's care. You're really getting a sense of the things that they can do, uh, you know, and what they can and what they can become, and the powers that they have, and they really are very individualized. And that's something that is it's really hard to do when you're just basically even just two writers writing all of these different characters here. And they don't all have the, the same, you know, they don't all have this, the same page time, but they are given very solid definition to who they are and what they can do. So, I mean... You know, and Clay, uh, Clayton Henry is the artist for this issue. For the most part, uh, it doesn't have it. It does have some, uh, again, some a little abrupt style changes throughout. Uh, I think it's Pepe Lopez is the other artist's name that's working with uh, with Clayton Henry here, but that's again in the present day, and all the flashback stuff is handled by uh, Clayton Henry. Um, so, you know, the, the book is, you know, this issue is incredibly dynamic. It's very, very strong. It's shocking in some parts. It's very, very well written, very smart. And it's an issue. And again, I'm so glad that I got into these books because, you know, Harbinger is, I consider to be the best of what, uh, of, of what uh, Valiant is doing right now and to, have you know, and Bloodshot and Archer and Armstrong and Exo Man of War are, are definitely you know all kind of running parallel. To, you know, not well, not quite parallel. The the quality isn't quite as good as Harbinger has been, but it's still really good. And Bloodshot has been a very entertaining comic book to say the least. And and there are some issues that are really great, and there are some issues that are just kind of well, yeah, that was good. But you know, bringing them together here is making for a very powerful package. It's just again the the sort of robocopiness of this whole uh, you know uh, Harada protocol that Bloodshot has it seems a little you know. It did seem, it kind of took me out of the book for a few minutes uh, when it's like, and, and there's some really interesting stuff going on in those in those pages. But again, it was like, really? They're kind of doing this? So, I mean, I understand why it's there. I just, it kind of took me out of it. So I would, you know, but it's still a very solid four and a half out of five for Harbinger Wars number two. Now on to another number one. And that is 
another independent, and that's 10 grand, number one. Now, this is the new book uh, from, uh, uh, from J. Michael Straczynski and Ben Templesmith on art, where it's basically they, they're crafting the tale of Joe Fitzgerald, a former mob enforcer who is who dies along with his wife and is brought back from the dead and acts as sort of a PI now. And basically, he has made a deal with the angels in heaven that if he, you know, that he basically cannot follow his wife to heaven because she has lived a righteous life and he has not died a righteous death nor has he lived a righteous life. But if he lives in service of the angels and does their dirty work for them on earth and dies a righteous death, each time he dies, even though he will feel the death and all of its pain and all of its suffering, he will have the opportunity to spend five minutes with his wife again, to be reunited with her. And then he will be resurrected again. And again, and again, and again. Uh, but basically what we're looking here is that he is given this case where he has to look into what may be a cult and maybe a demonic cult, which seems to be right up uh, the, the alley of what Joe is looking for. But as it turns out, the person that he has to go up against may be the person that he thought that he killed two years ago and is also one of the, and I think, at least from what it seemed like, is the person that is responsible for his and his wife's death. And he's a, a necromancer of sorts. Um, so it looks like he's going to have to deal with that before he gets the chance to die again and meet again with his wife. Now... I don't know how many more. I was reading a review of this on CBR, and they did mention something, and it was very yeah. I'm like I'm I'm totally right on board with pretty much everything they're saying. I don't know how many more times this trope can be trotted out over and over and over again. Of okay, here's the man. He and the, you know, he and the person, you know, he and the person he loves die. Uh, one of them is sent back to uh, make the wrong things right or to balance the scales between good and evil or to whatever. And it, they always have this perfect ideal lover uh, that they, they figure will be their reward for this or will be, you know, they'll be rewarded in some way. Now, we've, we've obviously, we've seen it with The Crow. We've seen it with Spawn. We've seen it with other, uh, you know, other comics and other genre material. For instance, uh, there was a great show in the 90s called Brimstone that I think lasted for maybe two seasons at the most. Um... And it's a great show, and I loved it, even though it wasn't great. But it was, you know, basically about a cop who, uh, you know, his wife is raped. He kills the rapist in cold blood, uh, but then he dies in the line of duty and is sent to hell. And he is released from hell to basically uh, to pursue six. I think it's sixty three souls that have escaped from hell and it's just it's a really good show and john glover who's an, an awesome actor plays the devil and also ended up playing uh, i think even an archangel in the run of the show i don't know if you've seen i don't know how many of you might have seen it this was on fox it was at, i think it was on either before or after the x-files on friday nights when that show used to be on friday nights in the 90s uh, the, the, there was that, and there was, like, Strange Luck, and, you know, there were a lot of good shows that kind of, and, and Sliders, you know, I mean, the good kind of, you know, the kind of the fun kind of 
sci-fi stuff that either led into or came after episodes of the X-Files. But anyway, so this is, again, this is a trope that's done to death. But I will give JMS and Temple Smith credit for bringing some new elements to this. Um, you know, it is kind of, you know, a hard-boiled detective story. You really get the sense of that. There's, uh, you know, this kind of hard-boiled, uh, you know, inner monologue that we have from Joe throughout the issue. Uh, there's some, some good dialogue exchanges here, uh, particularly when the young woman who presents him with this case and gives him the 10 grand that he normally charges for his work. Uh, that he can apparently sense just by weight. Um, I, I like the scene where he is communicating with the the angels through a stripper. Uh, it's just you know it's kind of a you know, kind of him thumbing his nose at the powers that be here, um, and the art is awesome. I do really really enjoy Temple Smith's art. It's 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 so dark and wacky and crazy. I I, uh, I don't recall if he was the same artist that did some of the Cal McDonald, uh, uh, the criminal macabre stuff uh, from with Steve Niles, but obviously you know uh, did Thirty Days of Night uh, with Steve Niles, and you know it's. It is very strong, very evocative art. I mean, he has a very singular style, and it works very well to this book's advantage. Um, again, you know, and they bring, like I said, this kind of like, you know, uh, almost uh, otherworldly hacking ability that uh, that that Joe has. Uh, to, to look at things through a more spiritual filter as he looks into this this cult. Um, and it's... So it's interesting stuff, but again, it's just something... It's, it's a genre that's very tired. And I don't really want to keep seeing this. So, I mean, but again, it's it has enough of a twist to keep things interesting and to keep things moving... Uh, so I do have to give it a three and a half out of five. Um, it's it's nicely written, like I said, it's it's beautifully drawn. But again, it's just it's such a tropey thing to do that it does get a little annoying. So on to DC and another number one here, although this is a digital first, and this is Adventures of Superman number one. So this is, we have the big blue Boy Scout has, you know, finally his own uh, solo digital first series uh, that uh, basically he gets, you know, he, it is, it's non-continuity. He's in his classic duds and, uh, you know, and it's Jeff Parker and Chris Samney basically crossing the street to get a chance to work on... Kal-El. And basically what we have here is more of, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a sad tale really, uh, in which Superman is confronting a, a, basically a drug addict who is given a free sample of a very, uh, uh, very, uh, 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 well, let's say it's, it's meth with a bit of a kick. It basically gives him a very powerful telekinesis, enough to kind of lay the smack down on Superman, and uh, ultimately, the you know the issue itself for the short amount of time that we have does play out, and we get some really dynamic art, uh, some some nice story beats by Parker. And when this the addict eventually dies from the drug or just from the exertion of his psychic abilities, we get a glimpse of who created it and who it is. 
Well, if you were going to be given the opportunity to write a Superman story, what villain would you use? Not too hard to figure out. Anyway, but, you know, again, Parker and Samney do a story that, do the Superman story, and it is a doozy. It is very, very strong. Of course, you know, I mean, but the real capper here is Samney's gorgeous, gorgeous art. Uh, if this book had anybody but Samney on the art for this particular story, I probably wouldn't have that much invested in it, but his style suits this story so well. I know that the second issue has come out, and I believe it has Brian Hitch on art. I know they did the cover, the quote-unquote cover for this, but I will tell you, this is... It's a really strong beginning for this outing. I'm hoping that we'll get to spend some more time with the peripheral characters. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if this is the only one that I get, I'm okay with that, honestly. Uh, but I, I do want to read uh, the next one. Um, and just to see where this goes, because it's nice to see Superman in an out-of-continuity story where he, he, he has the, the red underwear back on and everything like that, and it's not the kind of armored version, it's the good old costume, and you just, it feels like Superman again. And this feels like a good kind of classic Superman story, not like an instant classic, but it's like more of a classical Superman story, um, where which, you know, he is obviously dealing with a foe, but he still treats the foe, he understands the villain of the piece in the sense that he's trying to help him. He's not trying to hurt him, but he also is trying to make sure that nobody else gets hurt as well. So, I mean, this is the kind of... Th this is why Superman is... Again, he's, he, he's not a book that I particularly always fall in for, but he's always a character that I like to watch, and this is what kept me coming back to Smallville for all the years that I watched it for and why I have all of the the seasons on DVD and some on Blu-ray uh, because it is always the compassion of the character that always does bring me back for a little bit more and when it's written in a fashion like this it is it's more interesting it's more exciting uh, and you just you get the sense that he's not you know, that Superman is always trying to use his power for good. And I like that. I know pe that bugs people as far as Superman is concerned. My wife, for instance, doesn't care for Superman at all because he's not kind of a, a darker hero, uh, unless, of course, he gets infected by some variant of kryptonite or what have you. Um, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> this is beautiful art. Really good writing for 99 cents, and it's four and a half out of five. Now, I wanted to talk about this a little bit longer, uh, because, of course, this is the big controversial book, right? Because this was supposed to have Orson Scott Card. And since Orson Scott Card is not on the, is not on this book anymore, because basically DC basically, you know, write, and I think, you know, there's pros and cons to the arguments. I've heard them all. Believe me, you know, Comics Alliance, you know, erupted uh, in regards to this one. And you had a lot of people for the idea of getting rid of Orson Scott Card and a lot of people who were okay with the idea of Orson Scott Card. Um, it, to me, it was just I didn't like him as a writer. Um, I think he's a despicable human being, but I don't think that would filter necessarily into his writing, but also at the same time, I didn't really, wasn't comfortable about supplementing his income with, with my money. So, but that's no longer the case here because he's not going to be writing it. And we have Jeff Parker working on it right now. And obviously good story, great art, four and a half out of five for Adventures of Superman number one. Now on to the final number one of the week. And that is the movement number one from DC, where we have Gail Simone is given her first original book in some time, 
at least as, DC, as far as DC is concerned. I mean, I'm talking about the first new original book. I mean, obviously she created Secret Six. Oh, I miss you so much. And this, the book, The Movement, is essentially her and artist Freddie Williams II. Uh, they basically give us th this, this book that uh, kind of deals with metahumans in uh, a very dark city called Coral City. And uh, they are basically, they are there as, it's a very, very uh, allegorical tale um, that does, well, okay. Uh, basically we have, uh, it is a is downtrodden versus the powerful. And the, the powerful and the corrupt. In this case, it's the Coral City Police Department. The opening scene has a, uh, a young man and woman who are just busted for marijuana possession. And one of them, big burly alpha males that they are, tries to extort sexual favors from the young woman in order to, you know, so they would go ahead and let them off. But uh, ultimately, they're all greeted by these not this uh they're flanked essentially by these mysterious masked individuals with uh all the you know with cell phones and everything like that and they say they have the letters i see you now at first i thought okay are they intending to put these cops into the intensive care unit or no it's dan it basically means i see you so yeah, that, that took me a minute. <laughs> um, well, not a minute, a couple, yeah, couple seconds, but anyway. And so they record this and they broadcast this over their channel M, uh, which is, you know, again, kind of this, you know, anonymous pseudo kind of WikiLeaks kind of thing, which do get the cops in trouble, but not suspended because there's this cap, there's this police captain that is looking to suspend them but doesn't have the power to because the, the 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 union rep for the cops basically says that the cop that this captain does not have the authority to take them off the street and basically they get they, they get this call about the cornea killer which is basically a killer that seems to remove the eyes so on and so forth of Vagrants, and they have to go to this area of the of the city that they all hate, called the Tweens, which is kind of akin to, uh, for instance, the Narrows in Gotham City. Uh, it's a place that nobody likes to go to, but they have to go there anyway. This is where all of kind of the downtrodden of the area live, of Coral City live. Uh, we have basically these characters that some of which we have seen before, some of which are new to the book. Uh, we have Catharsis, who we've seen Simone work with in the pages of Batgirl, uh, where Catharsis was fighting alongside Nightfall, but seems to be kind of standing up for the forces of good this time, uh, but definitely wants, you know, still dishing out uh, some ultra-violence. Uh, we have Tremor, who did appear in the pages of Secret Six, but a long, long time ago. Uh, and then we have Mouse, the Prince of Rats, who is uh, basically that he has mental, either mental control over over rats or can become a rat at will. Uh, and then there's their leader, Virtue, who is basically. Uh, basically can read people and follow a trail of emotion and read that emotion and read what exactly is going on. It's not quite like mind reading, but it's close. Um, and basically this young man who I'm sure will become part of the team at some point in time, who calls himself Burden, uh, is brought into a church, Presbyterian church, for some shelter. Uh, but what? But once he enters the church, he becomes kind of all exorcisty, and you know, turns his head around. He starts to grow the long nails and starts to sound incredibly demonic. 
Uh, and so the cops think that they have their cornea killer, the slasher, at the church. So they go en masse to get into it. And this is where, of course, the, the metahumans come into direct conflict with the cops. Catharsis deals her own uh, brand of justice on one of the cops accused most directly of uh, trying to solicit sex from this uh, from this young woman at the beginning of the issue, and definitely puts the hearse that her on them. Trevor non-violently deals with the cops and basically sinks a lot of the cop cars. Uh, you know, Mouse just basically looking to kind of cause havoc, and then um, uh, Virtue reading the captain and seeing that his wife is actually having an affair with one of his fellow police officers, even one of the cops that's there. So basically they tell him, get out, get lost. This area is, you, you don't want to come down here. This area is under our protection and we will watch out for you. And so the captain rushes into the church and they basically, because the, the young man, Burden, is not demonically possessed or anything like that, but he is, unfortunately, he is, he is severely mentally ill. And has met and has metahuman capabilities that lead him to manifest this kind of demonic possession, if you will. So it's basically you have a very well, I wouldn't say down to earth, but a more down to earth explanation than yes, he's demonically possessed. Uh, no, he's just he's a kid who's been made to believe that he's demonically possessed, so he's going to be under their protection as well. And the captain runs into the church to call back up, and he's looking to have basically the tweens area just completely just doze to the ground. He just wants to have it raised. And then he turns around, and everybody in the church, including the church priest, is are all wearing these kind of face masks that we saw in the beginning of the issue. So the people that are in this church, they are part of the movement. Now, at first, honestly, when I read that, I'm like, wow, it feels like they really kind of pulled that ending out of their ass. But no, they've actually kind of lured them in. They've lured the cops into this area to show them that these people are just not going to be, you know, they're not going to be neglected anymore, and they are going to be watching. So you have, again, kind of this anonymous WikiLeaks 99% kind of movement. Again, you know, the allegory for this is there. I mean, it's... A little bit ham-fisted. Well, okay, it's a lot ham-fisted at times with you know with the masks, with the all the social media form, you know the you know the camera phones and everything like that, and you know it's it actually sets it up kind of nice and creepy at first, um, but it is saying okay, well there's somebody that's looking out. So I mean we have this is a book that is wholly unique to anything else that exists right now in the New Fifty Two. There's no other book out there like that. However, there are some issues with this first issue, and it is there. And there are issues that first issues do run into uh, more often than not, um, and that is kind of a lack of definition of some of the characters. Uh, kind of a, you know, it seems like they're trying to pack a lot of information into a small space, and. These are things that don't quite reach the heights that a first issue needs to reach in order to, for it to get repeat business. Now, of course, fans like myself of Simone will continue to read this book, and more than likely, it will continue to get better. But for right now, this book's a little bit iffy. I wasn't so sure if I liked it or not the first time I read it, but I still bought it. And, you know, still, you know, did enjoy reading it, but just, you know, Freddie Williams' art is is very kind of, uh, it's kind of, you know, kind of a McFarlane, Capullo-esque kind of look. You know, it's very liney and, uh, you know, very, you know, very defined, very shadowy, so on and so forth. And it, it, it looks good, 
it can be a little bit of an eyesore sometimes. Just that art style, you know, if it's not Greg Capullo, because he seems to have much more definition to his work, his, his work is much more, uh, it, it's much more, it's not quite as exaggerated, I guess. Uh, as all of like the you know every single you know texture on the face has to have an individual line to it and so on and so forth that that does bug me I mean Capullo at least has a little bit of abstractness to his art and it works much to his benefit uh, and again the question to this book is you know how long can a book like this really last because it has no you know a list b list c list d list or any list heroes in it. It has, you know, a bunch of new characters that were created. So, I mean, there's no familiar names, there's no familiar faces, there's no familiar landscapes. So, this book is really, you know, I think not so much even in an allegorical sense, is about kind of trying to defeat the odds of success. And if it can become successful, then it will have you know, it, then that will be a fight that Simone deserves to win. Uh, but that will really depend upon the next couple of issues. Because this issue, not a great start, but a decent enough one to keep me coming back. So it's a three out of five for the movement number one. Uh, strong enough to keep things going. Uh, so on to Green Arrow number 20. And we basically have Komodo and Green Arrow. They're both kind of going back to lick their respective wounds. Uh, and Komodo is basically told to kiss off by his partners in, you know, the outsiders. Now, whether or not that's supposed to be kind of a... If they are, if there's going to be a new outsiders book... Uh, I don't know, and it will be made up of villains as opposed to heroes. I'm not sure, but that would be an interesting. Uh, <laughs> that'd be an interesting book, though. Um, and I'm wondering if they have anything like that in the works. But anyway, um, basically, you know, Komodo is on the outs because he failed to kill Oliver Queen, even though his company Stellmore did buy enough of Queen Industries to kind of take it over. But these are all secondary interests to eliminating Oliver Queen. So, um, so he's basically told to kind of stand down, but he still has one card to play, and that is the card of Naomi, the, uh, the one woman from Q-Core that is still alive uh, and just happens to be the, uh, <laughs> the girl that uh, the, the character of Fifth uh, was crushing on. So he plays that card indeed, and uh, and Ollie and Fifth go to because he, he recognizes where she she's kind of been strung up, sort of uh, almost crucified, uh, and in kind of this green arrow kind of outfit, and I mean not crucified, crucified, I mean, tied, but not you know no hammers in the the wrists or anything like that. So yes, be careful. If any stigmatics claim that they're bleeding from their hands, just remember that Jesus was actually not crucified through his hands, it was through his wrists. So, anyway, it's my, uh, it's my religious lesson for today. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he intends to play that card, you know, so he basically strings Naomi up with a bomb to flush out Oliver, which of course it does, but Fifth is there too. And while Fifth works to disarm the bomb because he is, a, you know, kind of a tech nerd, uh, he, you know, Ollie faces off against Komodo. And it seems to be we have a pretty good kind of not quite final but close enough, uh, you know, kind of I'll be back battle uh, where Ollie is victorious even without his bow. Um, and this basically leaves him open to, you know, this leaves Komodo open to escape. But it also leaves Ollie open to kind of completing to go to where to go and find Magus and find out exactly why, you know, who is Komodo? Why did he kill his father? You know, to get all of these answers that he's searching for that he's just learned. 
And so, of course, this leads him back to Black Mesa, Arizona. And as soon as he gets there, he is thumped over the head by, I'm assuming, someone either posing to be a sheriff or a sheriff that is in, uh, in Megas' employ. And, but at the beginning of this issue, we have, uh, again, we have Ollie uh, uh, confronting Megas, demanding answers. And but we don't get them in this issue. That's for sure. Uh, again, this is so much like the last issue, where it's like you know Sorrentino art, of course. Again, brilliant. Uh, you know, Marcel Maiola's coloring works so much to Sorrentino's advantage. Um, and the issue has a good a lot of momentum actually going for it. It seems to be going in all of the right directions until we totally get the, sl the brake slammed on us at the end here with this, you know, kind of, you know, Ollie getting knocked out and Magus is involved and there's this Mr. Butcher who's apparently carrying on a fucking hatchet. We don't know why, uh, unless that's why they call him Butcher. Or if his name is Butcher, that just happens to be what he carries around for his law enforcement instrument. <laughs> but it just, I mean, the wind, you know, it's, it, it's barely enough to keep you going story-wise, but of course the art itself is just so wonderful that you just want to keep looking at it and looking at it. So I will continue to go with this, but again, I'm sure that's, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Sorrentino is thrilled to be on kind of a, at least kind of a B-list book at the, at the, at the least. Um, but Jeff Lemire, again, we're really seeing how overextended he is, and he's been leaving a really sour taste in my mouth lately. So three and a half out of five for Green Arrow number 20, which brings us to our last DC issue, which is Animal Man number 20. Yes, I have dropped Swamp Thing. I'm not interested. Uh, I don't care. It's whatever happens next is not going to be anything nearly as good or as entertaining or as thought provoking or as beautiful as what we saw under Snyder. So forget it. I'm done. But since Lemire is still on Animal Man, I figured this still has a chance. Well, if this if this issue is any indication of what is coming up now that Rot World is over and now that everything whatever, then it's. This issue, basically, we go back to uh, kind of what we saw in issue number five of Animal Man, where we see uh, Buddy in his film called Tights. And we see how the action in the film is mirroring what's kind of happening with uh, Buddy in his reality, you know, his loss of, you know, He's lost his family. His wife wants nothing to do with him. He can't connect with his son. Blah, 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 blah. And then we get to this ending where Buddy is alone. He's all kind of fucked up. And, you know, he gets a call from his agent. Uh, and his agent basically lets him know that he's been nominated for Best Actor for the Academy Awards for his work in this film. I mean... What a fucking snooze this issue was. I mean, it was like, oh my god, what is going on here? I mean, there's got to be more that Lemire can do with this book. I mean, he's the guy that revitalized this character after years of it being kind of boring. And, you know, but Lemire's run on Animal Man has been so much more hit and miss than what was going on in Swamp Thing, and those were, and these are kind of like, they're brother books. I mean, they kind of belong together. And if there was, if they decide to ever do an Ant-Man Swamp Thing, just a, you know, like a green and red, you know, book that featured both of these characters working alongside of each other all the time, I would probably be all over that book. But it's not. So, and this, this issue was just, so, I mean, because it was too on the nose for everything that we were seeing and I didn't like issue number five you know at all really to begin with anyway so this issue just made it worse you know it's just 
the mirror, you just really get the sense in this in this book, in this title, that he's just grasping at straws, and everything that he's got is just whatever. I'll just write this book so that I can write these all these other books that I'm writing, and you just get the sense he's really tired, and he, I get the sense that he is kind of, even though he is one of DC's favored sons right now, he's certainly, you know, very much living in the shadow of a lot of other people there. So, this was, I would say, at best, you know, John Paul Leon's uh, art here is pretty good, but this was, at, you know, at best, this was a one and a half out of five. This was an extraordinarily disappointing issue. Uh, and just everything since the death of Cliff has just been kind of just spiraling downwards. So that's it for the the worst book of the week. Now let's talk about our picks of the week. In which there are two. One's a little bit lesser and one's a lot more if that's a word. Anyway, so we're going to start first with my favorite pulp that's on the stands right now. The spider number 11. So we have a new villain here who calls himself the Lawgiver. Now, if that, of course, doesn't bring back some shades, you know, some shades of Judge Dredd to anybody, then I don't know what to tell you. But anyway, Lawgiver... Lawgiver is targeting what he perceives to be either sanctimonious or dirty cops. And he's killing them. And But this most recent death where he blew up a cop bar also happened to connect to an apartment building that was partially destroyed and innocents were also killed in this as well. So this, even though the humiliation that we witnessed of the spider by the fly in the previous issue uh, is very much first and foremost on his mind, at least it seems to be until we get this reveal of what has happened here at the hands of Lawgiver. And this has to take precedence because, of course, Nita arrives, Nita comes to Richard basically saying that the lawgiver has requested that her husband, Commissioner Kirkpatrick, turns himself over to him to whatever reason. Um, and Richard discovers through his uh, through his little team, his agents, his assistants, his helpers, whatever you want to call them, that uh, his house, his home, his office, all these things might have been bugged. So they all meet for pizza, which is the code word that they use, to discuss what the hell exactly is going on. And... Uh, Basically, they try to work out a plan in which they can debug, but you know, also find out what the hell is going on with the lawgiver and see if there's any connection between him and the fly, which, of course, does exist. In fact, the fly is the one that is helping to support the lawgiver, and the lawgiver's outfit is in this kind of very uh, kind of English, uh, old-timey dress uh, of like a, a judge, you know, they, they, or you know, a, a member of you know, a member of the bar, a barrister, if you will, you know, just like this kind of dark, almost like a fencing kind of mask, you know, surrounded by one of those big, long, stupid wigs, um, and uh, all basically, you know, these bombings that he's committed are being supported by the fly. Because the fly is just looking to really fuck with the cops and, by proxy, fuck with the spider. Um, and they are, and the sp and the fly is in knows that Richard Wentworth, of course, is the spider. And so he's actually set uh, uh, Richard's phone to take 
pictures at random intervals and upload them to him in which there is a photo of him, of Richard going into his closet where he keeps one of his spare spider costumes. And he sends this information over to everybody's favorite cop, Detective Hilt. And basically, Hilt gets the go-ahead for a search warrant of his place, of, Re of Wentworth's home. While, uh, while the spider is chasing down more leads on the, uh, the association between the lawgiver and the fly, because the lawgiver is priority number one right now, in which, of course, we have a lot of bloodshed, um... And we have this, uh, this encrypted SD card that the spider absconds with, but then he and Jackson, basically as his driver, get into a police chase in which he ditches his costume and, all, and his guns over a bridge. Uh, and then, but there's massive roadblocks. There's no escape. Jackson thinks he can make it. They can't. And of course, Hilt is there to slap the cuffs on Richard, basically arresting him for the crimes of the spider because they have found, because in the, in the, in, in the search of his home, they did find the spare costume. And if that's not enough, that Richard is being hauled off to prison and that the SD card has been destroyed by Hilt, we find out that it's Hilt himself. Just we, the audience, not Richard, not anybody else, but we as the audience find out that Hilt himself is the lawgiver. Wow. Uh, David Liss and Ivan Rodriguez are doing such great work on this book. I mean, just moving this book at such a terrific pace I mean, it's 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 really almost it's it's breathtaking to behold a book that's paced as well as the spider is. All of the issues have been good. Some of them have been great. This is another great one. Um, terrific dialogue. I mean, a great deal of intelligence and thought put into every issue. Really good art by Rodriguez. Again, still missing Colton Worley, but. Again, I've learned to live with his absence. Um, but Liss really is, you know, I mean, these two working together have definitely, you know, it, it kind of makes you more or less forget that Worley was, was on this book. But the book, so fucking good with Colton Worley, and, but is still so fucking good with Rodriguez here. So, I mean, just all of the shocks, all the surprises, the great cliffhanger here. Um, I mean, just everything, you know, this is a terrific, terrific issue, a really solid arc here with, you know, the introduction of the fly and everything like that. And, you know, and now this, this other villain, which happens to be, you know, the one son of a bitch that we're hoping that Richard gets to take out at some point very soon. Um, you know, the kind of love story that's going on here. You know, I mean, there's there's so much good stuff happening in the Spiders. So absolutely a five out of five for the Spider number 11. Terrific, terrific issue. But Book of the Week ultimately goes to... This is going to probably piss some of you off. <laughs> Goes to Superior Spider-Man number nine. This is... Basically, this is the dance slot that I've been missing. Um, since kind of the finale of, you know, the, the final arc of Amazing Spider-Man. Because, as you know, I have been a proponent of this book, but also have been a detractor of this book. There were a couple of issues where I really thought I was going to drop this, but I'm not. And this is the reason why, is because it has the capability to still give issues like this. 
It is basically what we have here is that Ock has discovered, as we found out in the previous issue, that Peter Parker's brain uh, brain waves have been kept alive in Otto's brain, and that's how he's you know been distracted, so on and so forth, uh, at certain points in time. And we have the, you know, how we see that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the golden Octobot uh, imprinted, you know, Peter's brain patterns onto it and residually contacted, you know, got into, uh, you know, that is basically, you know, his, his brain is still present. His consciousness is still present in Otto's body, in Otto's brain. So this whole issue takes place entirely in their minds. And they are looking, to, and Otto, of course, is looking to purge, looking to purge all all fragments of Peter's brain completely from his own so that Otto can be superior. Now I know that's a point that's been kind of jammed down our throats here but we for the first time we see it as it is and we see you know Peter's first line of defense once you know because Peter is actively fighting the uh, the wipe, if you will, the purge of his brain waves. So then Otto matches his brain waves up with Peter's and goes inside. And there he is in his full Doc Ock regalia. And Peter's first line of defense, as far as fighting Doc Ock, are all of his loved ones, all of his lost loved ones and even the not lost ones and they are swarming all over Ock and but Ock being Ock has prepared for this and he has basically and he brings out all of Peter's kind of rogues gallery including the burglar that killed Uncle Ben and he has to witness that once again in his own mind. And when that starts to fail, as Peter says, you know, you're still not just dealing with Peter Parker, you're dealing with the amazing Spider-Man. And he and there's a lot of talk about heroism in this book and what it means to be a hero. And, you know, he goes on about, you know, what was your first instinct when you found out that my, you know, that my brain waves were still present in yours? It was, to, it was to kill them. It was to kill me. And that's not what a hero does. You know, you've, you know, nobody, you know, nobody's trusting you right now. You know, yes, you may have, you know, J. Jonah Jameson's ear, but you don't have anybody else's. The Avengers don't trust you. The, you know, none of my friends trust you and you're going to fail. But this, you know, and he realizes that he's not the hero, but then Otto realizes that he's not the hero that, uh, that's, that the amazing Spider-Man is. He is the hero that the superior Spider-Man is. And again, we, you know, Ock sheds his former self in favor of the superior Spider-Man. And they do battle, again, but it's more, much more mental, obviously, than physical. I mean, even on the mental plane, there's obviously physical combat here, but this one is more about pointing out Peter's, his, his flaws. And that, for instance, that, you know, because he didn't, you know, put an end to the vulture, you know, he started, that the vulture started using young children 
as you know as his pawns for stealing and you know killing and that, you know, because he didn't kill Masker, Masker went on to kill 34 people, including Ashley Kafka, his, you know, Peter's friend. Well, you know, why didn't you do... And then, of course, to the events of the previous issue, where he almost stopped Ock from performing the surgery on the young girl, it was out of fear that he that he that Peter's mind would be discovered and all of these things end up ultimately overpowering Peter's consciousness and we have one of the more heartbreaking moments in recent you know certainly in I think I would say an almost all time memory of Peter Parker's life in which his consciousness starts to disintegrate around him to a point where he, we see the bugle cr crumbling around him. We see, you know, all of his, you know, mental artifice crumbling down upon him and he can't, to a point where he can't even remember his own name and complete the purge is done Peter Parker is no more I mean this was a breathtaking issue of this book I might be giving it a little bit more credit than it might actually deserve because this is not an issue I was expecting. I didn't expect this to be as incredibly strong as it was, but it doesn't matter really when it comes down to the long and short of it. Ryan Stegman returns for art here and his art works perfectly here. It's not Humberto Ramos. You don't get the really kind of over-exaggerated art that he does. This is very, you know, specified. It's extremely dynamic. It's extremely powerful. Which is not to say that Ramos can't do this, but Stegman is so much better suited for this type of issue than Ramos would have been. Or Kevin Coley. Or, you know, Stefano Caselli. Or maybe I, I would say that probably the only person that could have otherwise pulled this off in recent Spider-Man uh, illustration history is Marcos Martin. But, I mean, it's just, this is the Dan slot that I've been missing for so long. And it, it was just so mind-blowing because this is kind of, at least for the time being, this seems to be the final defeat of Peter Parker, that, you know, he no longer exists. Now, this, of course, is, you know, is partially there to help punctuate how much stronger his return will be and what that will entail now that he's been completely excised from Otto's brain. But, I mean, just an incredible incredibly emotional, very strong issue. I mean, it, you are, you know, I was choking up <laughs> at the end of this issue. I mean, it's it's that good. It's that strong. It's that emotional. It's that intense. And it's it's just a it's such a beautifully written book, a beautifully conceived issue, a beautifully drawn issue. This is just it's tremendous work and it is an absolute 5 out of 5 for Superior Spider-Man number nine. And it is absolutely the pick of the week here. So that's it for this week's new comics, bitches! Man, I'm hungry and tired. So I'm going to leave you. So thank you again for watching. If this is your first time here, feel free to subscribe. Uh, if, this is, if you're listening to this on iTunes, thank you for listening. 
Uh, if you haven't subscribed to me on here or on iTunes, uh, you can you can you know you can obviously just get because this isn't extraordinarily visual. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, not not so much as you know some of my uh, counterparts uh, from you know the really uh, nice work that a lot of my other. Uh, Com fellow community members do here, uh, you know, uh, the most obvious being uh, Oddfellow's thoughts. Uh, you know, it's just, I mean, the green screen work that he's <laughs> been pulling out has just been like, oh my god, this is so awesome. And it's a real thrill to watch. Of course, he's a lot more succinct, <laughs> and it's pretty much so as everybody else. Um, and uh, but, you know, you can go to, you know, just search iTunes for sh for the Shadow Gallery. You will find my podcast there, and you can subscribe there as well. And if you're there, you can also leave reviews. Uh, so I I'd like that. That would be nice. You don't have to review every single one, but just review the podcast and just say how much you're enjoying it, or if you don't like it, what don't you like about it? Um, and, you know... Of course, below, lots of room for comments, a lot of room for uh, criticisms, complaints, things that you're liking, things you're not liking. We will, I think, shortly have the uh, the final uh, uh, the final entry. Uh, well, there's there's been no more entries, so I guess that entry is closed for my contest in regards to uh, who picks uh, the book that I will like the most. Uh, since there were only three entries, and I'm really, you know, the second issue of one of them comes out this week. Uh, if that, uh, and I've read some of the other ones that have been recommended to me, uh, I, I pretty much know what it's going to be, but we'll see. You never know. So, uh, again, that's it for this week. Uh, in the Shadow Gallery, I, I welcome you to uh, again subscribe. If this is your first time here, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, don't care. Don't, you can follow me on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. You just type in James Donnelly there, uh, the one that lives in Chandler, Arizona, and that'll be me. Uh, the one with the, the Chicago Blackhawks uh, profile picture. And uh, of course, I'm on uh, Twitter, and that's at J that's at Donnelly nine two two seven four, and it's spelled D O N N E L L Y. So come and follow. I always like to tweet. So um, that's it. So thank you again for watching, or thank you for listening. Again, I'm your host, James Donnelly. This has been the Shadow Gallery, and of course I have to remind you once again, as always, to stay in the shadow.